Have you ever wondered if some languages are more complex than others? Well, in this video I'll show you how to use information theory to calculate linguistic complexity, and along the way maybe give you a glimpse into the mathematical beauty hidden in grammar. If you've ever studied a foreign language, you might empathize with that chimera era here. Learning any language requires you to memorize thousands of new words. But some languages make the task even harder, additionally requiring you to learn how to inflect each word depending on its context and meaning. For example, every noun in Russian obligatorily bears an inflectional suffix that includes two grammatical properties. Case, that conveys the noun's syntactical function, and number, singular versus plural. I'll refer to the set of inflected forms of a word as its paradigm. Each cell in a Russian noun paradigm is associated with a particular case number value. So if you want to refer to multiple dogs acting as the subject of a sentence, you'll need the form in the nominative plural cell. A single dog in direct object position calls for the accusative singular form. Across the world, we find many languages with inflectional paradigms as rich as Russians. But there are also many languages that get by with no inflection at all. Vietnamese nouns, for instance, make no case or number distinctions. At the other extreme, there are languages like Estonian, whose inflectional paradigms dwarf Russians. You might intuit that a bigger paradigm entails a more complex inflectional system. Estonian blowing Vietnamese and Russian out of the water, say. But we can be more vigorous about this. Specifically, two information-theoretic tools, entropy and conditional entropy, let us quantify the complexity of inflectional systems and compare complexities across languages. The examples I'll use to illustrate all come up from a really nice paper, Ackerman and Maloof, 2013, and besides walking you through their mathematical techniques, I'll also try to convey a fascinating insight of theirs into the organization of our grammatical knowledge. Before that, though, a little linguistics background. Languages often inflect words by concatenating a string of morphemes a morpheme being an atomic, meaningful grammatical unit. Here's a fully inflected word from Turkish. It's decomposable into four morphemes, a verb root and three inflectional suffixes. I'll note that stringing together morphemes to create a word is not an inherently more complex process than stringing together words to make a phrase, since what one language might express with an affix, another might express with an independent word. Compare this Turkish verb with its English translation. The grammatical elements are essentially identical, modulate their linear order and whether spaces separate them. However, there is a way in which building words from affixes can indeed be trickier than building phrases from words. That's because the same morpheme might take quite different forms depending on what word it belongs to. Check out the second Turkish verb, whose negative suffix has a totally different vowel. Dependent words, on the other hand, tend not to influence each other's shapes in this way. The English word not is identical no matter what verb it negates, say. More strikingly protean morphemes can be found in modern Greek. Here are the inflectional paradigms for two nouns. The nominative singular of human ends in os, while the same form of mountain ends in a different suffix, o. Other cells in the paradigms likewise vary, like the vocative plural or accusative plural. These inflectional differences are quite systematic, in fact. Many Greek nouns behave like human, many like mountain. These words are said to belong to different inflection classes. And in fact, there aren't just two, but eight inflection classes for Greek nouns, as this table illustrates. This is a lot of information to absorb, so let's just focus on the suffixes, which I'll represent from here on with just phonological transcriptions and slashes. To more clearly appreciate what's going on here, let's merge adjacent cells with identical suffixes. This highlights a few key patterns. Note how all nouns in the genitive plural end with the suffix own, and that the nominative, vocative, and accusative forms are identical in most inflection classes. However, Greek inflection is still a little chaotic. These suffixes, for example, have quite different functions across classes. There are two questions we'll be addressing about Greek. First, what is the gestalt abstract complexity of the language's inflection system? Second, what consequences does that paradigmatic organization have for Greek speakers who need to predict an unknown word form? In Ackerman and Maloof's terms, these questions address, respectively, enumerative complexity and integrative complexity concepts related to the number of inflectional contrasts a language requires, or their interconnectedness and mutual predictability. To get at these questions, we'll use the concept of entropy. Informally put, entropy measures the uncertainty about or predictability of some outcome. Imagine you're doing a little gambling and have to bet on the outcome of a coin toss, a dice roll, or a random card draw. Clearly, betting on the coin toss would be safer than betting on the card draw, since there are so many more cards in the deck to choose from than faces of a coin. 
entropy caches out this intuition. 100% predictable outcomes lead to an entropy of zero, and as the number of equally probable outcomes increases, entropy approaches infinity. Let's note that the entropy of a system x as h of x. It's defined as the weighted sum of the log likelihood of all possible outcomes for x. Take the coin toss. The probability of landing either heads or tails is 1 and 2. Plugging these values into the formula, we arrive at an entropy value of 1 bit, where a bit is simply defined as the amount of uncertainty associated with a choice between two equally likely outcomes. Calculating the entropy for a dice roll or a card draw is not much harder. These have values of about 2.5 and 5.7 bits. Note that a handy way to compare complexities is to raise 2 to the power of an entropy value. That results in the number of equally likely choices the system has equivalent complexity to. 2 to the power of 5.7, for example, is 52, the number of cards in a deck. Here's an important property of entropy. As the probabilities of outcomes becomes more skewed, entropy decreases. After all, predicting the outcome of a fair dice roll is more difficult than predicting a rigged dice roll. So if your rigged die rolls at 1 10 times more often than any other number, entropy lowers to 1.69 bits. That's equivalent to the choice between about three equally likely outcomes. Let's return to our Greek data and extend the gambling metaphor. Imagine you have to open a Greek dictionary to a random page, slam your finger down without looking, and predict the correct inflectional suffix for the noun you've selected. The difficulty associated with this task is the paradigm cell entropy, or H of C. Let's calculate the entropy of the accusative plural and genitive plural cells. Guessing the genitive plural suffix is clearly the easier task. All Greek nouns in this form bear own. And indeed, the entropy of the Greek genitive plural paradigm cell is zero bits. What about the accusative plural cell? Well, there are five possible suffixes that can appear there. Us, es, is, a, and i. Their actual probabilities could be estimated by calculating the proportion of Greek nouns that belong to each inflection class, which are bound to have unequal distributions. That's a little too much work for us, though, so instead, we'll assume that all inflection classes are equally likely. Remember that equal probabilities maximize entropy. Therefore, this simplifying assumption means that we'll be calculating the upper bounds of Greek's inflectional complexity. And in fact, everything we've calculated today can only be higher than the actual entropy values. Since only one out of eight inflection classes use the accused plural suffix us, while three classes use a, we can replace the blue term with one-eighth and the yellow term with three-eighths. Filling in all the probabilities this way yields an entropy of 2.15 bits for the accusative plural cell. Repeat this process for the other case number values and calculate their mean, 1.62 bits. In other words, predicting a random paradigm cell for a random Greek noun is about as difficult as choosing between 2 to the power of 1.62 or around 3 equally likely options. So paradigm cell entropy sheds light on the enumerative complexity of Greek noun inflection. However, it doesn't really reflect anything meaningful about speaking Greek. That's because language users never need to guess a random form of a random word. However, something speakers do do regularly is use a word in an inflected form that they've never heard before. This happens even in English. Here's a word that was recently added to the Oxford English Dictionary. I, for one, have never heard anyone use the verb dingle, and the OED only lists its present tense form. Nevertheless, I'm very confident that the past tense form is dingolade. It's because knowledge of the present tense form of an English verb is usually enough to accurately predict its past tense form. If your language is more inflectionally rich than English, you can imagine that this scenario will only be more common. The bigger a word's paradigm, the less likely it is that you'll have heard all of its forms, and the more likely it is that you'll have to place an inflectional bet on a cell sometimes based on partial linguistic knowledge. Information theory gives us a tool for measuring the difficulty of this task. Conditional entropy. Abstractly, conditional entropy, notated h of y given x, is a metric of variables' interpredictability. For our purposes, it'll quantify the difficulty of predicting an unknown paradigm cell given evidence from a known cell. We can calculate h of y given x by considering all pairwise combinations of the values for properties x and y, and summing up the log odds of encountering y given knowledge of x, weighted by the likelihood of x and y co-occurring. Let's calculate the conditional entropy of the genitive singular cell given the accusative plural. This value can't be too high. After all, if you know that a word's accusative plural suffix is either us, is, or e, you can be certain what the genitive singular suffix is. 
What will increase the conditional entropy, though, is the fact that the other two accusative plural suffixes are not uniquely associated with any particular genitive singular suffix. So we need to consider every logical combination of the genitive singular and accusative plural suffixes. There are five of each, but thankfully only seven of the logically possible 25 combinations are attested, as shown by this table that rearranges the inflection class patterns. We'll start by focusing on which genitive singular suffixes can co-occur with the accusative plural suffix a. The partial sum corresponding to this row is calculated like this. Since three of the genitive singular suffixes never occur in the same paradigm as accusative plural a, these three terms will all be zero. Again, assuming that all eight inflection classes are equally likely, the blue term must be two out of eight. Classes five and six both have a in the accusative plural and u in the genitive singular. Likewise, the red term is one-eighth. Just one of the eight inflection classes has this suffix combination. As for the conditional probabilities, note that there are three inflection classes with accusative plural a. Two of them take u in the genitive singular. The last one takes os. Therefore, the green and yellow terms are two-thirds and one-thirds, respectively. A bit of arithmetic gives this partial sum. Repeating the process for the table's other rows, we arrive at the values here. Sum them all up and flip the sign to get the conditional entropy of the genitive singular given the accusative plural approximately 0.59 bits. Next, we calculate the conditional entropies for every other paradigm cell combination. I'll spare you the gory details, but averaging over all of the values yields a mean conditional entropy of about 1.66 bits. That means, on average, predicting an unknown inflected form of a Greek noun given previous knowledge of some other form is about as difficult as choosing between 1.6 equally likely options. Let's summarize. We've used information theory to show that the enumerative complexity of Greek noun inflection is fairly high. After all, there are eight paradigm cells, 12 phonologically distinct suffixes, eight inflection classes, and across these classes, a given paradigm cell can be associated with up to five distinct suffixes. An average paradigm cell entropy of 1.62 bits reflects this abstract inflectional complexity. However, the integrative complexity of the system, which better measures the difficulty associated with speaking Greek fluently, is quite a bit lower. It's because most of the suffixes are found in only a few cells, and the attested cell-suffix relationships are highly interpredictable. An average conditional entropy of 0.66 bits reflects this. These mathematical tools can be applied to any kind of paradigm in any language. So to give some crossing linguistic context to the Greek findings, Ackerman and Maloof calculate various complexity metrics from nine other diverse languages. Their findings are quite striking. While average paradigm cell entropy can be extremely high, the average conditional entropy for these languages' inflectional systems is always much lower. Take the Chikibitalon variety of Masatek. This language has an extraordinary enumerative complexity. With so many affixes and inflection classes, its average paradigm cell entropy is 4.92 bits, a complexity comparable to predicting one of about 30 equally likely possibilities. Nevertheless, Mossetek paradigms are organized in such a way that inflected forms are highly unpredictable. The conditional inflectional entropy for this language is a mere 0.7 bits, barely higher than Greeks, so Mossetek inflection does not pose as huge a hurdle to its fluent speakers as you might expect. What can we take away from this small sample of languages? Well, there are no obvious limits to enumerative complexity other than the brain's memory capacity. I might argue this isn't that surprising. After all, affixes are not fundamentally different from independent words, and it's estimated that adult native speakers of any language know on the order of 10,000 distinct words. So, even the huge inventory of inflectional affixes in Mossetek is a drop in the bucket compared to the size of a lexicon of any average language. A more interesting finding is how constrained intricative complexity is, that being a proxy for the complexity of actual language use. Ackerman and Maloof's findings show that there's a remarkable amount of structure even in the most apparently chaotic inflectional systems. Let's return to the question I started the video with. Are some languages more complex than others? Well, I've only answered a much more narrow question, focusing on inflectional complexity. It's very common for non-linguists and even some linguists to conflate inflectional complexity with broader linguistic complexity, perhaps because rich inflection is so flashy and languages with it tend to be less familiar. But I really want to emphasize that this is a fallacy. Inflection is but one of many, many grammatical dimensions. Besides learning the rules of inflection for the language, speakers must also internalize principles governing how sounds can combine into words, how words can combine into sentences, what meanings a sentence can have, and so on and so on. And in principle, all of these dimensions are entirely independent. 
Mazatec may be more inflectionally complex than Vietnamese or Russian or Estonian, but from that we cannot conclude that it is a more complex language as a whole. That's because in practice, a language with very complex inflection might have a much simpler, say, phonological system or vice versa. Information theoretic tools like conditional entropy are general enough to be applied to any linguistic dimension. Therefore, it's theoretically possible to calculate the complexity of an entire linguistic system, all of a language's grammatical subcomponents, not just inflectional rules. As far as I know, there hasn't been much progress in calculating whole language complexity for any given language, and I'd imagine doing so would be quite a monumental task. But pursuing whole language complexity metrics might allow us to address some fundamental questions about language. How much does linguistic complexity vary? Does complexity in one grammatical domain necessitate simplicity in another? What would make a language too complex for a child to acquire? And perhaps relatedly, what factors conspire to ensure Ackerman and Maloof's observation that average conditional entropy is so low? To conclude, I hope you've learned a little about information theory and its applications in linguistics. More broadly, though, I hope I've managed to convey a smidgen of the wonder that human language instills in me and other linguists. And if you already appreciate the astounding patterns that emerge from formal systems like cellular automata, or the magnificent geometric patterns that litter nature, you're well on the way to appreciating the exquisite, but quite well hidden, mathematical beauty of language. Till next time.